I'm Diane Barrett. I'm with the BE Collection and I'm interviewing Sheila Morris. And you are in South Carolina? Yes, South Carolina. South Carolina, I've never been there. Ah. Huh? But now come. it's a Wednesday, May 18th, 2022. And Sheila is our honored guest today. So I'm going to, this is basically a conversation. We take about max an hour to discuss what's going on with you and your past, your future, your dreams, whatever. And um, it's for the intention of recording our past because it is a legacy project to inspire the future. So hopefully some woman could sit down and say, well, I'm interested in somebody that's a CPA. And then they get information about your process, your progress, and they get that in about 15 minutes because as we edit it down, we shorten the hour. So that's why I was mentioning to you, since you have an extensive background, that you may find that you'd like to also interview with the Mazer, which is a lesbian archives that's been around a long time. I really appreciate being included in your uh, collection, uh, yours and Margaret's, and I think it's a great project. And, um, you know, I, I, I consider myself kind of a personal historian. So this is very important to me that um, okay. we, we have a voice and use our voice and, and preserve our voices. You've got it. You've just written the ad for the whole collection. <laughs> well, thank you. No, I mean that. Um, I did one interview with a mask on. I hadn't planned on it, but it just happened that instead of Zooming, the person showed up at the door. And so then it was done with the mask. And I thought, well, it's COVID. We're documenting the past, but also the current. Right. Exactly. And, uh, so I was, and it went well. It was fine. Good. Good. And then um, the current political scene is very important to women, to everyone, but especially yeah. to women. Yeah. So we have a lot of women that were, um, and still are organizing marches and um, protests. And so it's a resource for you, for all of us to go back and see. We've interviewed about a hundred people now. Wow. I know. Yeah, that's great. Really that's is, it's, it's super, it really is. Did you? you know, I, let me just comment on what you just said about the current political events is that, you know, I, I find it so uh, frustrating um, to have been involved in this same fight 50 years ago uh, no. and to find myself having to, you know, uh, consider the possibility and the probability that, um, uh, you know, the, the fundamental rights that we've won can be taken from us, um, which in turn bothers me about, of course, LGBTQ, um, uh, in, you know, uh, things that have happened, marriage equality and so on over the last years. And it's just so tenuous. Uh, I had thought that it was, you know, permanent. But um, you see this with this uh, court situation as it is today. It's very, it's, it's not only frustrating, but it's frightening. I think it's an insult. Uh, just for um, Judge Barrett, Amy Coney Barrett, and I'm sorry she has the last name I do. Um, to say, well, this would be good for lesbians because there'd be more babies to adopt. I mean, yeah, what yeah. an insult. Yeah, that's an insult. Yeah, just that's with no thought. Insult. Yeah, no, it's definitely an insult. Mm -hmm. And you're right, we thought it was permanent. Are you married? Are you legally married? Yes, we are. And yes, okay. we got legally married, yes. And, and you know, it was so important to us and such a momentous thing because, um, you know, in South Carolina, we've had such a struggle and mm -hmm. to have marriage equality come to our state, you know, um, we were the 35th state um, actually to um, have it and then the universal, you know, one for everyone. And so anyway, um, it, it, it's, it was very important to us as, as right. you know, to have that. And to celebrate it. Yes, and, to and celebrate it. That's fully. exactly right. Yes, right. So uh, yes, feel free to speak out on it. Um, women are, and I'm asking also, because this is today for us. Yes, it is. So you were born in Texas, I saw? Yes, I, I was born in Texas. I was born in a, a mm. Rimes County, Texas. Uh, and uh, it's about 90 miles Northwest of Houston. Mm -hmm. um, and it's very rural, very, agrarian uh, kind of economy and um, 
I was born into a family where my parents were both uh, educators, um, but their their families were blue collar people. Um, and my dad went to college on the GI Bill after World War II. Good for him. Yeah. <clears throat> what was their, his major in college? Uh, he well, he had several majors, <laughs> in college, <laughs> but uh, he he decided uh, to to be a teacher, and so he majored in education <laughs> finally. And he got his uh, uh, undergraduate in that. And then he went, got a master's and another doctorate. So he went as far as he could uh, in his um, uh, education. And they very much, and my mom taught um, school also, and they were very much believers in public education. That's great. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so that's the background that I came from. Not a, not a affluent, certainly, but a wealth of, um, education. Oh, right. Yes. Do yes. so you have siblings? No, uh, I was and have an only child, um, mm -hmm. and uh, so I I spent a lot, a lot of time uh, in the little town. There weren't many children around, um, so I spent a lot of time with my imagination, which I think um, helped me um, later on in in when I became a writer. So. Um, um, but yes, spent a lot of time by myself. Did you uh, have an imaginary friend that you created? <laughs> I had several imaginary friends, mm -hmm. but they were all involved with uh, uh, being cowboys and, uh, you know, in Texas, uh, you know, some farming, ranching, agrarian. Um, but um, I had a horse when I was growing up. Um, and so that was very important to me, riding horses and that kind of thing. So um, all of that, um, plus watching Westerns on Saturday mornings with my dad on TV. Um, so we, we, we spent a lot of time with that. When were you aware that you were a lesbian? Um, actually, Diane, you know, I was aware that I was different at a very early age. Mm -hmm. um, I talk about that. Um, I had two memoirs that I wrote. And the first memoir was actually um, Deep in the Heart, um, a memoir of love and longing. And in that, I discuss uh, the little girl that I played with. Um, I, I, we, you know, we played together some. And one day I, I asked her if she would marry me. Mm -hmm. um, this was when oh. I was, yeah, pre, this was preschool. This was probably about five years old, maybe, uh -huh. maybe six. Mm -hmm. And the little girl was, you know, <laughs> real, um, obviously about a year younger than I was. And I said, would, would you, when we grow up, would you marry me? Mm -hmm. And she said, no. And I said, no, why not? And she huh? said, who would be the daddy? Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought that was about, you know, that kind of hit me at that very young age that there was something, you know, different. And I didn't have any role models. I didn't know. Uh, I, I didn't know the terms. I didn't know anything about it, but I just knew that I wasn't quite like the other little girls. Um, so I would say it's, you know, it, it's been, it was there from the beginning. I couldn't identify it. I didn't have a name for it, but the feelings were there definitely, you mm -hmm. know, very young, very young. What was your answer to who would be the daddy? I told her I would. Uh -huh. um, and so she wasn't satisfied with that. Um, uh, so <laughs> she didn't really think that was a very good idea. Her background doesn't it tell you where she was coming from at that young age? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. We and speaking of background, let's just put this in there. You know, uh, my family, you know, uh, was uh, conservative Southern Baptist. Um, mm -hmm. We we were in church. You know, uh, whenever the doors were open at the church, mm -hmm. and and so uh, you know, and that was something. That also was formative, I think, for me, because I grew up in a church where, you know, homosexuality was uh, preached against. Uh, and, and that's when I kind of knew, too, that what I was feeling might be that somehow related to that. Mm -hmm. And if it were, then it was an abomination, you know. And if it was an abomination, then uh, the preachers would talk about uh, hellfire and brimstone. Now, I didn't know what brimstone was, but I sure knew what fire was. Mm -hmm. And I knew that that wasn't a place that I wanted to go. Mm -hmm. But 
those influences, um, and you know, back then, I don't know if you, any of your other people have talked about this, but you know, after World War II, um, homosexuality was actually criminalized mm -hmm. and considered right. to be a, um, a, a mental illness even. And, you know, uh, lobotomies were performed and, you know, horrible things were done in the name of um, uh, psychiatry, psychiatrist, um, you know, work. And I so give you one. When I was a student nurse, the student nurses were required to assist in um, shock treatment. Yeah, yes. We didn't know what we were doing. We were just required to uh, hold the patient down while they were received shock treatment. When I asked what this is for, you know, I was like 17, right? Oh, because they're really depressed. And a lot of these people were close in age to us. Yeah, yes. Yeah. So there was so much of that subversion and it was yeah. awful, right? Yes. And, that, and so that influenced us, you mm -hmm. know, both of us. And, right. and, you know, and so that's how it, it forced me and maybe you too to think, you know, uh, I better keep this quiet. I better not let anybody know wh who I am really, because if I'm an authentic person, then I got a lot of trouble. I mean, I can be, you know, horrible things done to me on this life and I can go to hell afterwards. So, <laughs> you know, it was, uh, uh, the messaging was not good for a, a child. No, um, not a great future. No. I suggest that um, as you go through our webpage, you read Barbara Beck's. Um, okay. You know, mm -hmm. They're all wonderful, but hers addresses this. Okay, good. Where are? You, what's the most interesting thing that you've done in your life so far? Huh. <sighs> that's a that's a good question. I think. Well, I I think probably. The most interesting thing um, that I've done was when I switched careers from the working with numbers mm -hmm. uh, in so many different ways for 40 years. And then for the last, starting in 2008 to right now, um, to writing and becoming more of a, um, uh, I, I do blogs, but I've written like, you know, three books of essays, two memoirs. Um, and the most probably interesting of the writing experiences has been doing, um, participating as the editor of a, an anthology of Southern perspectives on the queer movement. Um, what, what it is, is I, I interviewed um, uh, 21 different people 21 different stories um, about the people in South Carolina who actually formed the organizations that are the foundation of the LGBTQ movement. And these folks um, uh, started in the late 80s, early 90s. And, you know, we, we formed different organizations to accomplish different things. But that was going on with us at the same time the public knowledge in San Francisco and New York was being written about. Mm -hmm. We were working here too, but nobody was really talking about us, you know, because we were kind of a, you know, not very aggressive. Right. <laughs> so the I think AIDS that's, crisis affect you where you lived. That's I think that's what started us on mm -hmm. on our on our uh, journey uh, was losing our friends um, to AIDS. You know, it was just you know unbelievable things and out of that because most a lot of the families weren't supportive of those guys and so out of that we had AIDS support groups the Palmetto AIDS Life Support Services the AIDS Benefit Foundation so these huh. groups were formed and then from that we began to think of not just the AIDS and health crisis but also political things that were going on and you know how do we form? How do we how do we uh, impact our own community in a positive way beyond just the AIDS crisis? But I think the AIDS crisis was definitely the springboard for all of it. I would agree with that. Right. Uh, just tragic tragedy.
just like COVID, you know, we were totally out of control with it. Right, right. And, and to this day, there is no vaccine for AIDS. Yeah. Yes. So it's a lot of work out there, I think. Yes, I agree with you. How did you move from Texas to where you are now? Oh, I don't think we've got time uh, to tell that story today. <laughs> We'd have to do that on the Mazer. <laughs> Let me just say that it was a roundabout way. Uh -huh. uh, I lived in Seattle for a while after I got, you know, left Houston um, after college. And, you know, uh, and then I went back to Fort Worth to seminary for a while. But anyway, as you would imagine, I followed a woman to South Carolina. Um, and, um, that's, and when I was younger, that's about what I did. Um, I, 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 I was, uh, I was basically involved with women though, who didn't identify openly as lesbian, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they were, uh, they all, uh, and, and not, it's not like there were a hundred of them, but, um, the three or four, um, that I was involved with originally, uh, and one of them that thankfully led me to South Carolina, uh, where I've stayed, huh? uh, you know, they didn't, they really weren't, um, uh, I kept wanting uh, somebody that uh, started out with me on the same page. And finally, Teresa, the one, the woman I've been with for 21 years, finally, I found somebody who, yes, who lived an authentic life. Um, and, and we have made that work together. Um, so it's, it's been a, a joy for me and a, just, you know, a, an amazing time, really. Okay, so since younger people will be looking at this, that someone that's on the same page is a real key factor for a successful relationship. Right. So you just gave them something really important. I hope so. And that's so important. It really right. is. It's vital. Yeah. I yeah, it, it's a, you don't start at the same place, there's a good chance you're not going to end up at the same place, mm -hmm. you know, because um, uh, it, it's so it's so difficult to try to bring somebody up to speed, you know, into what you think is speed anyway, up to speed. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and then it's such it, it's so hard to have a relationship anyway. But when you start out you know, with, with those things against you, it's, it's almost, it, it's just going to be really, really tough. So for any young people who are watching this, mm -hmm. take, uh, take this for what it's worth, but try to really do find somebody that you have, you know, uh, that you're, you're basically at the same place when mm -hmm. the important things you can be, you know, but the important things, your core values, hopefully that they'd be the same. I think it's important too that they're comfortable with their sexuality. Absolutely. That's Absolutely. A, right. Yes. That's the same page. Right. That is definitely the same. It's an important, it's the first page. <laughs> it's the first well, page. That's right. 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 <laughs> that is the first page. No, because that isn't going to change. That you can't make somebody comfortable when they're not. No, that's a, they, I that's learned that very hard lesson. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, you had hundreds of women you were you know, engaged with, so. <laughs> Not hundreds, don't say hundreds. <laughs> Maybe they learned from you. Well, uh, I don't know. So how'd you go from being a CPA to being a creative writer as you are now? Um, you know, that's a great question. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, you know, I, I had um, started out, uh, you know, with a degree in accounting at the University of Texas and went to work as an accountant, became a CPA, actually did a lot of things other than just CPA over the 40 years. I actually went into securities, um, uh, stocks, bonds, all that, financial planning. I taught college for a while. Um, so I've done a lot of things with that CPA background. I was like, so what did we indicate on your thing where we put your profession? How would you like us to list you? Um, now you can list me as a writer um, okay. because, you know, 15 years ago, that's that's how my life changed. What, and, changed, what made that direction change? Well, I'll, I'll be honest with you. Um, I had a, a case of the shingles 
Um, when I was, uh, you know, uh, 60, what would that make me? 61, 62. Anyway, um, in 2008, I got a case of the shingles that landed in my eye. Um, oh, and wow. when the, yes, and when that happened, I was unable to, I, I mean, I, it was a really, really bad case. I really could have died from it. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I, I survived, but I wasn't able to continue working in the career that I had. So it, what happened? it was forced on me as a forced retirement kind of. So was your vision impaired by the shingles? It was at that time. I got glaucoma in my eye. Um, I, you know, it, I, I could heart, I really couldn't see out of my right eye. Um, but that has gradually over the years that has improved. Mm -hmm. Um, so thankfully, yeah, um, just so, the pain is awful too. But yes, right. but it, it gave me an opportunity to, um, you know, I started writing little stories, mm -hmm. um, and, um, then I, I gave them to my wife, Teresa to read. And she said, these are really good stories. You should make a book. And I said, oh, how many should I write to make a book? And she said, oh, I don't know, 25. So I said, okay. And so I started writing those. And they became my first book, Deep in the Heart. Um, and, you know, from there, I just kind of, it was like I had always meant to be doing this. Mm -hmm. uh, but I had worked with numbers so long that it had clouded my words. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, but now they, it was an opportunity for me to make a huge, huge shift, seismic. And, um, and that's what happened. So how did you begin to sell the, your books? Um, that's a, that's, you know, um, it was very hard. It's been very hard because yeah. uh, the publishers that I've had up until the university of South Carolina did the book on, uh, the, history book on the Southern perspectives on the queer movement. The University of South Carolina actually published that. Um, but the other publishers I've had have been small boutique publishers. And so, uh, you know, you, you talking about word of mouth for your project, right. it, was, it was pretty much word of mouth for my books too. Um, and so the, let me just say that I've never been a commercial success uh, <laughs> with my writing, never. Um, yeah, so there's still time. Yes, maybe, yes. But um, but it doesn't. I mean, that really hasn't mattered to me because um, mm -hmm. I I it's not that I have un, unlimited resources or anything. Uh, but I'm grateful for Social Security. Let me just put that in there. Huh? Um, right. I appreciate that, um, and I uh, hope uh, Republicans don't get a, take a, take away my Social Security. <laughs> but anyway, uh, huh? so. Um, so that helps and, and Teresa works. And so, you know, we, so we get along, but I uh, luckily, you know, that has not mattered to me because I've just wanted to write. I've just wanted to right. say things that I've, I've always wanted to say. And so I have now, and I feel good about it. Um, and I continue to blog. Um, and, and that's been a really, a, a you know, I talk about contemporary issues and, and I give my opinion and it really doesn't matter if anybody likes it or not, because it's just my opinion, <laughs> you know, <And> so, <laughs> I mean, I'm 76. And so, you know, at 76, I really don't care too much about what other people are thinking. You know what I'm saying? It's a good thing. It's a relief, isn't it? Yeah. yeah it's right. just, yeah. It's just what it is now. And so, you know, uh, the discrimination I felt, um, you know, through my career uh, in in working with numbers, uh, mm -hmm. well, there was always discrimination. The salary gap uh, was a huge uh, surprise to me when I uh, started work in the real world after college. And the very first job I had, you know, the guy that I worked with was making $900 a month and I was making $650 a month. And so I went to the partner this is a big huge C, you know cpa firm in houston and i told the guy i said oh gosh i said there must be some mistake here because you know, <laughs> this guy's making 900 and i'm making 650 he said the first mistake is neither one of y'all should have been talking about how much money you make 
And he said, so, you know, that's that's the first problem you got. Don't ever talk about your money with anybody else. And I said, well, if I hadn't, I wouldn't have known that we'd had this little mistake. Right. That not a mistake. Um, this is how life is. He said, he's, man, he's gonna make this amount. Because remember, this was 1967, before any type of, you know, equal opportunity, employment benefits, anything. You know, this was back when there was nothing. And so he just told me flat out, he said, you're a woman, he's a man, and you're not ever going to make as much as he does. Well, so I'm how old was, was, was your boss that told you all that? He was a white haired man sitting behind a big old desk with a kind of a nice tan. So I knew he played a lot of golf. And so he sat back there and told me, I mean, I'll never forget the man. And, you know, and he, he just looked like um, some kind of a god sitting back there, you know, and and he just told me that. So I had to quit. You know, I had to say, uh, this isn't, I didn't say it at that moment, but I, thought, I had thought it, about it. I said to myself, you know, well, I got to go someplace else. But actually, it didn't really matter. Um, no matter where I went, same problem. It was the same thing. Mm -hmm. So when the Equal Rights Amendment came along in the early 70s, I was by that time living in Columbia. And so I that was my first experience as an activist was uh, joining the National Organization for Women to try to get the Equal Rights Amendment passed in South Carolina. By the way, it failed. Um, so anyway, um, it was, but it was a learning experience and it, it introduced me to, um, you know, what activism really was, what what we had to fight for for social justice issues, which became invaluable in my work with the LGBTQ community. Do you write about that? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Good. No, excellent. Yeah, I yeah, I put it all in. And uh, when I had a nut, uh, just one little other thing, I don't know how much time we got here, but one little other thing, um, uh, when, um, uh, I was working for um, uh, a big um, in financial services group. This was much later. This was in, well, I was with Teresa at the time. So it was early 2000s. And um, I had won a number of awards for the firm for sales. And, you know, really? yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I was one of their top, you know, people in, in my area. Did they know you were a lesbian? What did these did your firm know that you were a lesbian? Yeah, they they did, but mm -hmm. they but they still this is what they did. I went to the awards um, conference, which was in Hilton Head. Teresa went with me, um, and um, so they called us in the room where we were staying, and they told me they said you're welcome to come to the uh, cocktail party before the dinner. But if Teresa comes, um, that's another $75 for you really? because we're not having her come uh, as your guest. And um, I said, well, I don't understand that because everybody else has their family, they're labeled to get their spouses, you know, there. And I said, you know, she's, my spouse basically this was before we were married right. but i said you know she's my spouse basically and i i don't understand the the problem and um he said well she's not welcome that's the problem Ooh. so Ooh. you know i tell you we cried you know because those people i've been working with for years and you know they all knew her they knew we were together and then they said that to our faces though and I mean, we, of course we left. I mean, I, I wasn't definitely not going, you know, when that was the right. attitude, but, you know, and what was odd is the very next week, I got a call from a recruiter who, um, who just out of the blue, you know, was calling dialing, you know, and he asked me if I'd be interested in making a move to a different firm. And I said, Hey, you know, I said, I might. I said, but the first question I'm going to ask you is, do they have domestic partner benefits? Mm -hmm. I said, because that's a deal breaker for me. You know, 
And the recruiter said, gosh, you know, I don't know. Nobody's ever asked me that. And so she called me back within, I don't know, a day or two and said, you know what, they do. And they are, you know, very cool with that. Uh -huh. so, uh, so I switched firms. I, I, so I, what was the name of the first firm that uh, said that your partner wasn't welcome? Edward Jones. Okay. Well, I've heard of them. Yeah. Big. Right. Mm -hmm. Big. And now how about the one that said um, it wasn't a problem? Uh, it was it was, a, it was a regional firm, not a big firm like Edward Jones, but it was um, the financial advisors for H and R Block. Mm -hmm. uh, they had it; they were just creating a new division mm -hmm. uh, I see. for their um, uh, company, and so um, they needed a manager for to begin this process in my area. So I w we went there, and I'm going to tell you when I signed up to put her name as my you know, spouse on this benefit page. I cried. I sat there and cried because it had been so painful to. I know. I'm so angry and sad and mad that that happened to you and your partner. Yeah. That was awful. Just, but we all go through that and we stuff it and go on. I mean, but that's awful. Yeah. I'm proud of you for walking away from it. Yeah. I sent him a letter too. Don't think I didn't do it. I wrote them a letter too, and I told them why I was leaving, mm. and how disappointed I had been, and how you know how hurtful that had been to us. And I said, you know, this firm is is doing wrong by this. Now mm. it turns out, you know, twenty years later, what do they have? They have you know same sex marriage, you know, arrangements for benefits. So, but oh. you know, back then it was a whole right. different ball game, whole different ball game. Well, you'll hear as you uh, read the interviews how women lied just to get a job. They denied their sexuality. They said, no, I'm a lesbian. I'm not homosexual. They didn't ask if they were lesbian. They didn't want to use that name. You know, yeah. but they, and, you know, they lived with that lie all their life. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But they had to, have, had to have work. As women, we have to support ourselves. Yeah, that's okay. true. And that's my... True. my my coming out at work was an evolutionary process. Uh -huh. it, it didn't just, I just didn't start out, you know, saying, hey, hey, I'm a lesbian. Hey. <laughs> guess what? I'm gay. Yeah. That, that wasn't how I started, but, oh. you know, um, it, it, it just evolved. And, and gradually, um, you know, it, it just, I, I don't know if it was getting older or what, but anyway, I just didn't care anymore. You know, I just said, you know, this is wrong. You cannot let people get away with treating you disrespectfully wrong. But no, you're really impressive. I'm proud that you're part of the lesbian society, so to speak. Well, yes. I think I'm a charter member at this point. I think so, too. <laughs> I'm a lesbian. Right, right. <laughs> What's your favorite fairy tale? Uh, my favorite fairy tale. Hmm? Uh, that's a good question, too. Um, Mm, let me think. Let me think. That's a good one because I have a granddaughter now that we read fairy tales with. Uh -huh. uh, and I I think, I don't know, is the um, is the Three Little Pigs a, a fairy tale? Yes. Okay. If that qualifies, then that's my favorite because she loves it now too so what's your favorite house they kept blowing them down right oh yes they kept blowing and blowing and blowing the house down um i guess my favorite one was the house of uh stones which they couldn't blow down mm -hmm. right what's her favorite uh she loses interest uh, uh she, she yeah. loses interest <laughs> at about the uh when they start blowing and blowing uh, she's she's out of there. She's that's she, right. she doesn't think that's as funny as I do. <laughs> so how did you happen to get a granddaughter? Um, Teresa was married to a guy um, mm -hmm. in her early life, um, and she had a son, one son, mm -hmm. uh, and he is now. When Teresa and I got together, he was fifteen, mm -hmm. um, and he's now thirty six. Um, he's married and has two little girls, one two and a half years old and one 
uh, four months old. So we are. So you sent a photo of her, huh? Excuse me? She's in your photos. She is in my photos because she's uh, the most important little <laughs> child ever. And she sort of looks like you. I, <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. I mean, I think I, I remember that. Huh. So that's great. <laughs> yeah. She, it's a, honestly, I never thought that I would ever have a grandchild. Mm -hmm. I, you know, that wasn't, but, um, you know, it's, it's just been an unexpected, incredible experience. And we are every bit as silly about our grandchildren as any grandparent ever. Right. Well, it's such a joy to meet you. Well, it's been a great time. I hope it's helpful. I hope you can use some of this and, um, Absolutely. Yeah, I've, I've enjoyed the, I've enjoyed it. I really have. So if you knew that your life was going to end soon, how would you like to be remembered? As a person that, um, you know, that just didn't settle. Um, as a person that um, persistence um, uh, passionate mm -hmm. um, uh, and compassionate um, and just never gave up I, I, I'd like to be remembered that way you're a leader well I, I, I have been a leader so it's it's been that's been a privilege right uh, and it, it it just is. I, I don't know. It's hard thinking about the very end of your life. It, you know, um, I spend more time thinking about that now than I used to. Um, right. Good, good but, <laughs> you know, but um, uh, I, I I don't know. It, it's it's very difficult to think. You hope that you're doing what you're doing. You hope that you're leaving, you know, behind something. The uh, a legacy of something and that you lived an authentic you know you were an authentic person when you lived um, and so I, it's hard to know I don't know what I'd say about that but that's a good question I'll I'll get back to you I'll get right. before late hours <laughs> so now for your career we're going to put down author yes you know yes. what's in there or anything that'd be great author okay. is good all right thank you Yes. I look forward to seeing you again in your couples interview, and I look forward to meeting your spouse. Thank you so much, Diane. I really appreciate it. My right. regards to Margaret. I will tell her that. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>